Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our first reading from the book of Acts, chapter 3. Peter said, Therefore, repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you. When Tina and I were newlyweds back in 1975, our car was a 1962 Falcon. had a straight six motor, and that motor depended upon the carburetor to mix the fuel in the air and send it into the motor to be burned. That carburetor was the heart of the engine. The trouble is, when you mix air and gas, everything else wants to stick to it. So dirt and gunk build up fast. And those of us that remember them, remember that carburetors are an absolute nightmare to work on. And then I discovered carburetor cleaner in a spray can. This was great stuff. Even had a long, thin tube that attached to it. So you could get right down inside the carburetor and even get to the jets. You could make that carburetor sparkle. And made the engine run. and It would even start. Now, I don't want you to think that this is like a rerun of car talk. That's not what's happening. But... I think we're a lot like carburetors. The world around us and our sins makes us dirty. We get gunked up. And so our lives don't run very well. And the longer we go without cleaning, the worse it becomes. There's just no getting around it. We need to be cleaned up. As David Brenner says, Many of us have been graced by the presence of the smartest person in the room, the guy or gal whom everyone else invariably defers to because of his or her towering intellect, awe-inspiring wisdom, or extraordinary insight. Perhaps, like me, you're just a bit envious of that person and even aspire yourself to the lofty role of being the smartest person in the room. I propose that instead we set our sights on being the biggest sinner in the room. Now, some of us are naturally gifted as sinners and would jump at the chance to compete for such a distinction. That's not what I have in mind. Although I'm all for setting attainable goals, Rather, I'm suggesting that in any room or situation we find ourselves in, whether murderer's row at San Quentin, a crack house, a convention of abortion providers, or even a gathering of televangelists, we think of ourselves as the baddest of the bad. The biggest sinner in the room. Me? How so, Pastor? Really, I haven't killed anyone. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't robbed my neighbor. As Brenner says, a fundamental principle of Scripture is that any thought that leads up to or contributes to the breaking of a commandment is itself forbidden by that same commandment. What that means is just thinking evil things or imagining forbidden things. Any thought or action that can lead us to a sin, all these things are sin themselves. So we're back to what seems to be the pastor's favorite drum to beat lately, but following God is a heart thing, not a head thing. God is not just after our obedience and the things that we do. 
That's not the point. But that is what we tend to aim for. We like to concentrate on just the actions that we take. Like it doesn't count if we get caught. Or if we don't really go all the way through with the sin. We're missing the whole point. Following the law and actions was what people in Isaiah's time were all about. And that the same thing was true when Jesus was there. In fact, Jesus quoted Isaiah when he was talking about the leaders of the church. He said, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. The truth is that we are sinners who are going to sin. And so I'm with Brenner. I think we should always set attainable goals. So our goal should be to be and to see ourselves as the biggest sinner in the room. Every week we go out into the world and our sinful thoughts and actions gunk us all up, clog up our jets, and the worse it gets, the worse we get. Sin always leads to more sin. And so we come to God's house in pretty bad shape. God gets out his heart cleaner. That would be Jesus. When we repent and return, Jesus' death and resurrection gives us forgiveness, and that forgiveness washes us clean. Christ's forgiveness washes over us. That's what Peter's saying in our text in Acts. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. When we repent and return to Jesus, we are refreshed. We are renewed. We are given a new, a clean heart. When that old falcon had a clean carburetor, it would start and it would run like a champ. At least as much like a champ as a 62 falcon could run. When we repent and return to Jesus and are made clean, it's not just us who's happy. God is happy. This is what Jesus came to do, to set us free from sin and death, to bring us times of refreshment from the presence of the Lord. That cleaned up falcon ran better, and if a machine could be happy, he was happy. And I was happy, because now the falcon could do What I ask. God takes great joy in a sinner repenting and returning and being refreshed. Henry Nouwen says, God rejoices not because the problems of the world have been solved, not because all human pain and suffering have come to an end, nor because thousands of people have been converted and are now praising him for his goodness. No, God rejoices because one of his children who has been lost is now found. So we we are not here this morning to be beaten into submission. This is a joyful occasion. We repent and return to God and times of refreshing come to us from the presence of the Lord. What could be more joyful than coming back to Jesus to be refreshed? Well, I guess that depends on whether or not we see our need. Irma Bombeck saw the problem that can come when we think life is all about our actions and not about our hearts. She wrote, 
In church the other Sunday, I was intent on a small child who was turning around smiling at everyone. He wasn't gurgling, spitting, humming, kicking, tearing the hymnals, or rummaging through his mother's handbag. He was just smiling. Finally, his mother jerked him about, and in a stage whisper that could be heard in a little theater off Broadway said, Stop that grinning. You're in church. With that, she gave him a belt, and the tears rolled down his cheeks and added, That's better, and returned to her prayers. Suddenly, I was angry. It occurred to me, the entire world is in tears. And if you're not, then you better get with it. I wanted to grab this child with the tear-stained face and hold him close to me and tell him about my God, the happy God, the smiling God, the God who had come and the God who had to have a sense of humor to have created the likes of us. What a fool, I thought. Here was a woman sitting next to the only light left in our civilization, the only hope, our only miracle, our only promise of infinity. If he couldn't smile in church, where was there left to go? When we don't see ourselves as the biggest sinner in the room, then we can start to feel pretty smug about ourselves. When following Jesus is just about keeping rules better than others, then we can look around and say, look at them. That one got a divorce. That one has a problem with alcohol. Oh, that one over there is hardly ever in church. We can start to think that the goal is just to keep the rules better than others, and that will impress God. (laughs) We think we're so impressive and running well when in reality we are a mess. We are so gunked up with sins that we can't even get our motors started. Seeing ourselves as the biggest sinner in the room leads to one of the most often praised qualities in Scripture. Humility. When we are humble, we don't come before God as if we don't really need it. As if God's pretty lucky to have someone like me showing up here. As if we don't need to pay attention to His Word or to be excited to come to the Lord's Supper to be cleaned up. We sure don't come here happy then. It can become more like running laps or taking our medicine or wipe that smile off your face. If we can't smile in church, where is there left to go? The biggest sinner in the room is humble. That's how Christ says Christianity works. In the world, Jesus said, people like to have authority over one another. They like to become the best by clawing their way over the top of others, but not so with you, he said. You are to be the servant of everyone. The world around us does not understand that. But Jesus is telling us how to become happy and fulfilled. You see, God created us to serve each other. That's where we find true joy. So when life is not all about us, that's when we really start to live. Being the biggest sinner in the room does not mean that we see ourselves as not being worthwhile, you know. We are worms! No. The world is hung up on self-esteem, but we have Christ-esteem. We know what we are, and we know what Christ makes us. 
We become beloved and valuable children of God in Christ. If we can live life believing that we are the worst sinner in the room, but that we are so valuable that God's own Son died to set us free, then we can start to see that other people need support. That other people need encouragement. That other people need to be served. And we can do it because we're not worried about ourselves. We get beyond ourselves and our needs. We become humble servants who are thankful to our Lord. And then we can say Amen to Peter when he says, Therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you. May we all go into our week of activities and challenges refreshed, cleaned up, and ready to go by the forgiveness and love of Christ. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.